you know, a, a lot of a, a missed opportunity here, I think, is taking a lot of these examples that work, that worked in the 80s in print and, 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 and television and finding a way to bring it into, into the digital. Welcome to episode 18 of the Science of Advertising show, the show where we talk all things neuroscience, advertising, and effective communication. The show where we disclose the advertising secrets that brands use to influence and persuade human behavior. And on today's show, we have Justin Oberman, founder of Oberman Partners and one of the leading brand response creative directors in the US of A. Welcome oh. to the show, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, leading brand response. I might be the only. I calls them that at least, <laughs> but right. thank you. It's, 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 uh, I'm really excited to be on this show, you know, uh, uh, following, uh, been, been listening to you and following you for a while and the whole, like, you know, the whole, uh, the science part of it, uh, it just, you know, fascinates me, especially when I start mixing in with the historical context and stuff like that. Yeah. I just, uh, I learn a lot. So I'm, I'm hoping actually to learn more than maybe you'll learn from me, but we'll see. Well, you're very humble because it goes both ways. One of the reasons I wanted to invite you into the show is I know you're an advertising historian. You know, you're an avid student of the art and science of advertising. And I have watched and listened to, to a lot of your content. And I think you could potentially add more value than I. But yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm really excited to have you on the show. But uh, let's crack into it because today we've got a theme. And the theme we're really going to focus on today is Fast food franchise brands is, is going to be really a, a theme. Some latest work from Subway and Grilled. And then we're going to go back to Wendy's, which has been rated top 10 in, in a number of different studies and surveys from advertising guys in the US. So a top 10 rated creative. So we're going to look at some new stuff and then have a look at some old stuff and, and really compare the difference. And to kick off the show, though, one of Coca-Cola's brands, Topo Chico. Let's have a look. Sparkling water, Topo Chico Heart Seltzer. Una contradicción perfecta. All right, Justin, there we have it. The latest from one of Coca Cola's brands. Topo Chico. Looks like it. It definitely looks like it's a Coca Cola brand. It, it has all the signature marks of uh, what Coca Cola tries to do. So, what, so what would they be? Done. What would be the signature marks that you see in that creative? You mean from a Coca-Cola perspective? From a Coca-Cola perspective. Well, Coca-Cola has a very interesting history. I mean, actually, if you want to look, if you want to really look at the history of advertising, one of the best brands to look at is Coca-Cola because they have been there from the beginning. You know, if you, if you place advertising history at around, you know, 18, starting as we know it today, starting at around 1880, then um, you will... Uh, you know, that's, that's around the time I, I forget the exact date Coca-Cola, you know, was founded um, and Coca-Cola invented the coupon, right? The way that Coca-Cola became famous was by uh, having their merchandisers, like having the, the, um, the, the, the people go to the drugstores, ask for a list of the addresses of their customers, mail coupons to their customers and saying for every coupon that you redeem, we'll give you like a, a, an extra jar of the syrup, right? So there was like all this double incentive. And then what they did is they gave away free swag. What do you need for the store? Open, close sign, umbrella. That's why to this day, you still see Coca, like you could find the vintage stuff. You still see Coca-Cola doing that to this day. So let, let's, let's not forget that, you know, 
they started very much in a direct response. <laughs> they pretty much invented, you know, that that uh, sort of you know aspect of it. Um, but at the same time, what they did beautifully is they they understood the importance of brand at the same time. So when you walked into the store, you got the uh, Coca Cola umbrella and the open floor sign, all that stuff, and and the ads became very simple. In the beginning, they were just like all the other patent medicine ads. Coca-Cola looked like every, you know, they did all the other patent medicine ads, right? And what they what ended up uh, turning into, right, was the, the ads that you see, like the pause that refreshes. And this actually came in the depression, right? That phrase, the pause that refreshes. So how do you continue to get people to buy sugary uh you know, um, uh, you know, caffeine drinks during the depression. Well, you know, you have a, a beautiful girl, and you have a, uh, a, a you know, a soft, uh, you know, uh, and and the branding combined with the the coupon things that they were doing. So that that's that's their model, and you see it like sort of just sort of play out. You know, they invented uh, Santa Claus the way that we know him today, with the the white beard and the and the red, uh, uh, you know, outfit. I mean, there's it's not as simple as that, but they certainly made that version of Santa Claus famous. So they've always been very into creating these like sort of idyllic scenes. Actually, yesterday I was walking through the airport and I saw that um, they had an ad of like a girl, a beautiful girl going like this with a Coke and smiling. And it was a photograph, but it looked very much like the old style Coke ads where, you know, it's, it's the scene and fa fast forward. Right. And then you get the, the, um, the mountaintop Coca-Cola, you know, we'd like to, if I could da -da -do 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 like that, you know, that bringing the music into it. And then it pretty much after that, every other Coke ad that you see pretty much, it's not about selling the drink anymore. They're so well established. It's, it's polar bears or it's, you know, creating, you know, what is a Coke? It's sharing it. It's a good time. It's happiness. It's, uh, it's, it's all these things. So, you know, I always wonder what if Coca-Cola were to sell a alcoholic drink, what would it, you know, what would they do? You know? And so I guess here's a sort of good example where they really kind of built in the lifestyle of it and nowhere do they really sell the drink or, or what it is, but I wonder if it works in that context, in the context of that ad. Yeah. It's really interesting because I, I, echo your thoughts in terms of it's a Coca-Cola ad in terms of structure, you know, there's, you know, Coca-Cola has always looked to own an emotion. Like what is the emotion? It's enjoy. So everything they do, it's, it's fun, it's enjoyment. And it's, it's really the emotional side of anchoring their brand to that emotion. This has gone in a slightly different, so it's a different theme. Like it's quite a Southern feel to it. But the one thing that I, I couldn't shy away from was if you look at a lot of historic Coca-Cola ads, they're really well branded. Like you go yes. to Coca-Cola Christmas, the Christmas truck, do you know, it starts off slow and it builds and builds and builds. Coca-Cola trucks going through this. You've got children running out to see it. And the Coca-Cola brand is so in your face. You cannot mistake that ad for a Coke ad. This one here, like I had to go through it a couple of times before I could actually really pick out the really subtle cues, like which there is an ice box or an esky on the back of the truck in the first 10 seconds, you missed it because it kicked in before the actual, the melodic branded music comes through. So there's a disconnect there. And it's not until yeah. you hit 55 seconds out of the 60 seconds that you've actually got this girl drinking the drink. So you've literally got this bandwidth in the middle that's been lost in a music video rather mm -hmm. than trying to sell a product. So like, I, I think the concept was there to create a song that embeds the brand. I love that because it, it just reinforces it time and time and gets stuck in your head. You know, arguably they could have done a better job of it, but it's a really tricky brand to actually embed or create a song around. So it's not simple, which makes it difficult to start with. But the scripts there, the execution is where I think it really fell down. It feels like the creatives and the artists got a hold of this one rather than the scientists well i don't know what you mean by creatives because you know I, I i consider copywriters to be creatives but um <laughs> but uh I'll say the artist then yeah well i think i think the producers the i think the production and the client maybe and um you know got in the way but what's interesting too is what you pointed out was 
if you look at classic Coca-Cola ads, even, even the Hilltop ad or whatever, there is a very strong sense of betweenness. There is, it's a moment in, it's a moment in time. There's, there's a story, there's something happening, whether it's a print ad or if it's an ad, um, they're on a rooftop and they, they open a can, you know, there's, there's even these ads where it's like, it's, it's a photograph and you see somebody opening it and it's like, try not to hear it or something like that. Like, like, you know, what a Coke sounds like when it's open, like they, they can own all these things. And this, this ad, it lacked all of that. It was a bunch of random scenes that weren't really strung together. A lot of pop culture references, a lot of PC references, a lot of, a lot of check, check marks, I think that, the, that they wanted to hit, but there's no, there was no cohesiveness between uh, or story or warmth. It's literally what or Orlando would, right. Would, would, you know, call a, uh, you know, a total left brain, sort of a left brain execution of a right brain concept where it's just, it's just totally that they have these to give their credit. They have people in, places at least you know not in random places but it happens so fast that it's made very clear that it, that that doesn't matter and so it really doesn't help you draw in that altogether and i will point out one thing i like their well i kind of maybe like their their slogan or whatever you call it this the uh, the perfect contradiction hard seltzer and alcohol although i don't really see why that's a contradiction Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I also don't get what I'm seeing is contradiction. I didn't see any contradictions in the in the ad itself. I mean, I saw drag queens playing a game of some kind. Is that a contra? Do drag queens not play games? I don't. You know what I mean? Like, there's maybe I'm too old and missing these references, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, it, I I'm sort of also missing what the contradiction here is. Yeah, you've you've nailed it with story and narrative because you look at that's why i use the music clip or it's a music clip it comes across like a music clip because in a lot of music clips yeah. there's not a lot of narrative it's just some some you know crazy type of imagery that that follows up or reinforces whatever they're trying to communicate whereas there was actually a study uh it was out not too long ago around the difference between just communicating a piece of data or communicating a piece of data within a story with a person and then communicating a piece of data within story with no individual. And on the latter two, it didn't matter if it was with an individual or as in situation, but it was still story. The level of memory that was encoded was double that without story. So when you've got story or narrative, that is the way humans really file away memory. So, you know, without that, it's, it's much hard to, to follow away. And the other thing with that, the, the one I do want to hit home with this brand as well, when you go into a liquor shop, it's very visual experience. So you need to really eyeball the product that you want. And this is a new product that you've never sampled before. So it needs to be very visual. As soon as you see it in store, you go, bang, I've seen that. What is that one? I'm curious about it. I want to sample. Whereas this creative was all around the song and drumming in the brand. Whereas the yeah. visual identity really, it wasn't there. So I like, I'd say from that perspective, you know, it, it could have been improved to really enforce and encode that visual identity to the viewer's mind. Well, I think that's a problem that a lot of packaged good or anything that's not an internet company has these days. Because in the in the olden days, you could, I mean, Coca-Cola has almost 100 years of establishing their brand in almost every medium that's been around. But if they were to have started with the internet, it would have been very hard for them as well. It's really hard if you think about it to establish a brand and a brand identity it, if you only use the digital media, right? If you, if, if you only use... Facebook ads and, 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 and banner ads and, and, and stuff like that. And, and it, um, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's a massive it's challenge. A challenge. I, I used to work with the largest grocery chain in Australia in terms of their advertising in store and path to purchase. And it was really interesting. All the insights that we got within that is people are quite robotic and they're, they're habitual. So they literally will go in, they'll follow the same path up and down the aisles, grab very similar products time and time again. So to interrupt someone's pattern or habit is incredibly hard. So you need everything in your favor to win that game. 
and yeah. advertising where you don't do everything in your power to create a very strong visual identity itself, you know, it, it doesn't help your cause. You need to create ways of people to talk about it. This ad doesn't do that unless it's just so cool that, but, but it's, it's not that cool, right? It's not that cool. It's not that unique. It looks like a lot of different ads of people trying to be diverse and this and that, you know, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that that's a dime a dozen now. And, you know, I, I can't get into too much detail, uh, but I'm uh, beginning to, or working on trying to get an account that's also try, in, in the packaged goods, uh, you know, trying to get into the supermarket chain too, and, you know, increasing distribution and getting people to go into the store and ask for it or look for it, or at least see it and be like, oh, I rem-, like that. And you just, you have to get people to talk about it. I won't go into detail here because I don't remember the details, but Stan Freeberg was a famous comedian who was hired by Howard Gossage at one point to do the uh, soup commercial, but he was also hired to do a tin foil, a foil by, by the, the one with the like 9% distribution compared to like Reynolds that had like 80%. And he basically created a campaign and like, I, so I can't remember the details of it. It involved people going and asking for this brand. And when the shopkeeper didn't have it hitting them, over, it was a cartoon and it hit him over the head with a hammer. Uh, and uh, so people thought that was funny. And so they would go in and asked, you know, and pretend to hit the person with the hammer and it helped increase distribution to a certain extent. But you, you just got to get people talking about it. It's really interesting. There's, there's an investor or he acquires businesses more so. He's a very clever marketer. Uh, he's in the US. He's a CEO of his own business, $100 million business. And one of the factors he looks at whenever he's investing or looking to acquire a business is talkability. And I think we actually had a little bit of chat about that the other week um, around mm-hmm. talkability. You know, he will only invest in a brand that has a factor of talkability about it. Yeah. Uh, and it's what is that factor? Because that is word of mouth. When you've got one individual that enjoys it, they'll tell two or three others, they will sample and you've got this. And word of mouth is the most powerful marketing on the planet. But we'll move forward because I, I want to rip into compare the pair. So we've got two ads here. They've been out yeah. for less than, oh, I'd say three or four weeks in Australia. So you may not know the landscape as well but they are from Subway and they're from Grilled. So Subway's launched this sub boat, which is like a nine foot boat. That's like a foot long that goes along water, which you'll soon see. And then you've got Grilled and Grilled have released three ads in this series, which is really Grilled versus Evil. Let's cut to Subway followed by Grilled right now. have it grilled and subway i'll take this one justin go ahead subway (laughs) well you may not even know it's subway because they don't even brand their creative (laughs) at the end of it so whether this says they're embarrassed about the creative they've just had and they've already paid for it so they don't want to put their brand on the end of it or not i'm not sure but all they've got at the end of it is just feels good so it feels like someone's come up with this weird and wonderful idea. Let's create this massive foot long, put it on some water, drag on a boat and have some people on top of it. And, you know, have this feels good. So like that's where they've gone with their direction. Then we've got grilled and grilled is very different. The one thing I really love about grilled, what they've done here, it's incredibly different to everything you'll see on our screens. And as soon as it is very different to everything that you see, you get attention. And you pay attention. You're like, what is this? What's going on? And that's one of the biggest challenges a lot of advertisers have right now is, is actually getting attention. So they've done that very well. They've got this track that they've used in all three of these creatives, which is this Reicher Burger guy. 
You know, it's quite catchy. It's quite memorable. You actually, I sit there and you can recall the righteous burger guy and that's a tagline and that's where they're looking to head. And Grilled have also looked at their long-term branded assets. What have they got in their franchise? You know, this might help you as well. Justin is in their burgers. They've got this wooden, little wooden stick with a little flag that comes in it with a grilled burger. It's quite iconic that they have, you know, and they use that in one of their references of their, you know, little wooden sticks, basically, you know, shooting at a clown that's very representative of what you'd suggest is McDonald's clown or Ronald McDonald. And what they've done here, they've created a, a, a character, which is the good guy and they've created the villain. So there is a story or a narrative that goes along with it. And the good guy beats the villain and saving the children in essence. So, you know, which of these two win? I think it's quite clear. Are they both, are they great ads? Do you know, debatable, but I'd suggest, suggest my opinion would strongly go if this was a battle, which it is, I go hundred percent grilled wins this. Justin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, what was the first ad again? Who is that for? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, uh, but uh, even before when we were when we were talking, you know, I, I, I said I can't remember which one that that ad was for because, uh, I, and I think they might mention it in the ad, but there's just so many problems with that subway ad that um, even like, cause in the beginning, you're like, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? You're so distracted by what's going on. Even if they mention subway, you kind of miss it. And then I'm like, is that the product? People are sitting on a sub, uh, you know, and what's with Swan Lake? Is it because they're on a lake? I, there's uh, maybe somebody was like, let's be total random and irreverent, but it, you know, that only works have an idea behind the uh, irreverency, right? Like, yeah. So a hundred percent, um, these, um, it, it remind me again, it's grilled, right? It's grilled, it's grilled, grilled, right? So we, we don't have the, that in the States. Um, and I'm just curious, who, who are these targeted to mostly? Is it, is it showing up like on kids, like Sunday morning cartoons, or is it, is it showing up uh, prime time? It's prime time. It's everywhere. It's not just yeah. kids, kids focus. So this, this, kids. this is actually a really interesting question. Cause I always like to, you know, hypothesize you're not in the room. So this is a challenge whenever you're reviewing ads is you don't know what the brief is and you don't know what the objective was. So it's, you know, it's, it's very challenging to, to understand the full context. But the one thing that I look at grilled, for example, was what was the brief and who was the target? Were they going after McDonald's specifically trying to take McDonald's customers and turn them into grilled customers? Or are you just trying to make people feel better about eating a burger that it's not McDonald's? They're not even a McDonald's customers. They're just like a burger, but they feel less guilty around it. That I don't know. And I'd probably suggest it's the latter, um, but they're just using McDonald's as the sacrificial lamb to position themselves as a healthy burger alternative because everyone knows McDonald's isn't great for you. Right. Well, I think that they could go after anybody i think that they at some point settled on this positioning of well you know we're we're going to be a uh, you know we're going to be the underdog brand we are the underdog we're going up, up against the giants um what what do we have this is you know you don't always have a unique selling proposition and you and to anybody listening it's very important that you hear you don't always need a unique selling proposition but in this case they had a unique selling proposition especially when you're going up against somebody else and in a very saturated market. So when you're in a very saturated market, you know, uh, if you, uh, you know, go through like the Eugene Schwartz, uh, you know, uh, product awareness slash uh, brand sophistication access model, you know, when you're in a, when you're in a very saturated market, you, your only options are really to e either start with a, a new mechanism that leads to a, a, the same benefit and you know fulfilling of a desire or really when you can't talk about you know uh, uh, when your product is different uh, or the needs or anything give people something to rally behind um, and here's just an example where they did both are they the most like the greatest commercials that I've ever seen no like I mean the animation it's fun um, and like you said, it's very different from anything that's out there. If this was playing in the 80s, it wouldn't be so different, at least in the States. Like, there were a lot of um, animated commercials, you know, like, like this. Um, but that's like, you know, the history of advertising is, is, is cyclical. So 
Um, and we, we see a lot of 80s stuff coming back now um, as, as the people who were kids in the 80s are in charge of things, right? So you see, uh, so uh, what I liked about it was uh, I've never seen this before. I, 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 you know, I haven't seen it before. I don't know about in Australia how potent television advertising is um, though. You know, um, and here it's a in the states it's an ongoing debate. So, uh, you know, I'd be curious what the effect of just doing that camp. I, I'd be curious to see how this is laddering out in a in an omni-channel sort of way. Um, but I really like their positioning, and I like the 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 grill like the grilled. It's got like an attitude to it, and it's like I'm gonna grill you, you know, and it's like like righteous like you know, like a righteous burger, you know, it's, 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 and they could take on anybody, you know, I mean, with, you, with that. You had the Hungry Jacks, it's not Hungry Jacks in the States, what is it, Burger King? Did you have the Burger King Whopper Moldy Burger campaign in the US? Yes, the multi, yes, yes. I was going to bring that up as a weird way of do, trying to do what um, these guys were doing. Yeah. So with that, you've got contrast. So you've got distinction bias. You've got, you know, here on the left is X here on the, and here's the difference. Like it's comparison, it's comparative, comparative theory. So Burger King ran that with the moldy burger. Here's a McDonald's burger. Doesn't, right. It doesn't disintegrate. Doesn't, it's literally, it's like plastic. Here's a Burger King. It gets moldy. It's because we use, you know, natural organic product, you know, which one's better for you. Grilled's gone the same angle, but more fun, do you know, more playful. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's a really interesting one where you're setting yourself up. How can I compare myself against someone in, in market? And interestingly, both of them have picked McDonald's. Yeah. I mean, I think they're going to, I think they could take on anybody though. I think eventually they'll take on the King and they'll take on, uh, they'll take on, I, you know, I, and I like the cartoon, the one where they're stabbing the guy. I, I don't know if we're showing that one, but stabbing the, the cows and making them <laughs> like bigger. I mean, like these are like fun visuals that you, you put, sometimes people need to see that over-exaggerated visual in order to be like, oh yeah, I get that. And, um, but the, the layer of fun with it is, is just really, it, it's really uh, a nice thing. And uh, Especially Burger King. Burger King is the more fun out of the two, right? If you're going to totally King or the one, yeah. the one thing looking at long-term branded assets, there was a, there was a study out of Australia oh, a couple yeah. of years ago. Now it was the the 2020 study, and it was looking at what elements within ads create long-term brand impact or or memory. And one of the big or the two key takeaways was either character or spokesperson, so creating a memorable character, which they're looking to do with this ad with the the righteous burger guy he's he's the hero and then the other one is acoustic encoding and an over index by 800 percent. so it is having song or jingle do you know these are things that people can recall and then link that to the actual product so if you're looking at burger uh sorry grilled they've done that they're creating a character they're investing in a character which they can continue to do and mcdonald's have always done that you know, which is one of them's in this script, but then they've also got song, the power of melody. Right. Nice. Well, let's have a look at the, one of the classics. And, and again, it's probably more native to yourself, but this is a very classic creative. It's, it's rated top 10, a whole bunch of different lifts in the U S this is Wendy's from the eighties. Let's have a look at what Wendy's produced in the eighties, just to compare against some of the latter work that's coming out today, you know, 35 years later. Over to Wendy's. It certainly is a big bun. It's a very big bun. Big fluffy bun. It's a very big fluffy bun. Where's the beef? Some hamburger places give you a lot less beef on a lot of bun. Where's the beef? At Wendy's, we serve a hamburger we modestly call a single. And Wendy's single has more beef than the Whopper or Big Mac. At Wendy's, you get more beef and less bun. Hey, where's the beef? I don't think there's anybody back there. You want something better. You're Wendy's kind of people. All right, Justin, Wendy's. Give I it mean, to me. Uh, <laughs> that's, I might be biased because that ad was out when I was a kid and I, I remember seeing it on TV, but that is one of, that is one of the, the best ads commercials ever made in the history of advertising. I mean, it's up there with, with the 1984 ad came out the same. Actually, I would say that if, 
what is the best ad of 1984 is not the Apple ad. I would say it's this. It's this ad. I mean, this created, it's certainly an American catchphrase. I think it's an international catchphrase. It was brought up in a political debate that year. You know, where's the beef means something now. Get people go around saying it just like they say, oh, always a bridesmaid's never a bride. And they're always surprised to hear that that was actually an ad for Listerine in the 20s. I mean, um, that ad is just perfect in every way. It didn't start out that way. The history of it is, is interesting. I also wonder if you, I should just make a note because the, the creative director and the copywriter for that ad uh, died last week, uh, Cliff Freeman. Uh, he was, uh, uh, I don't know if, I didn't know if you picked it on purpose, but uh, Cliff Freeman, uh, if you've seen him in art and copy, he has one of the um, classic lines in that movie, uh, in that documentary where he says that, you know, an advertise. He, he started his career as an encyclopedia salesman. And so he's like, how do you get somebody to, to, you know, you got five seconds when they open that door to say something that'll grab their attention. And what he says at the end of it is very good. He's like, so it's, it's to the point where somebody is like, Hey, yeah, this is American. This is America, like capitalism. Yeah. You're a good salesman. I enjoyed that. So what's interesting is he doesn't try to divorce sell like the f advertising from the ad. Like his goal is to make an ad that you know is an ad, but it's so good that you don't mind that it's an ad. That's exactly what this ad is. You know, it's an ad, you know, they're selling something, but you could watch it over and over and over and over again. And, and you don't mind. And, you know, a lot of people don't know that that ad actually ran two versions of it. One of them with old men and one of them with old ladies and the old lady one obviously won and that they, Wendy's almost canceled the ad. Uh, they almost said, we're not going to put it on the air like a week before they had to make some final adjustments, but everything down from the, the casting to, I mean, the director to the ad is Joe Seldemeyer, who's one of the, I mean, he's just a famous, uh, you know, he did the fast talking guy, uh, FedEx guy. I mean, he's very famous com commercial director and it's one of his early ones. So, uh, um, you know, what works about this ad is, is, you know, the catchphrase, where's the beef? Where's the beef? It's very, it becomes very memorable. Originally, the script didn't say where's the beef. It was where is all the beef, but the actress had emphysema, so couldn't say the line clearly. So that's how it became where's the beef, interestingly enough, which is an important lesson um, that, you know, don't get so glued to your script maybe. But, you know, throughout history, you know, you have, uh, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Try it, you'll like it. Where's the beef? You know, uh, these these catchphrases, uh, people like to say that, oh, that's the hokey pokey of what advertising, but hey, people remember them, you know? So they don't make ads like this anymore. I don't know why they should. No, look, Maybe this, I should. this is my, like, I look at this and especially looking at like the direct response, copy or brand response formula that sits behind it. Like it's yes. really clear, it's really evident. Like there's a structure to these ads, whereas a lot of new ads, it's more on like an artistic direction or like there's, there's quite a distinct contrast. So this, I uh, like looking to break it down, it's a simple idea, which is a problem where you go, you see a massive burger, but then there's not a lot of beef that's within the burger. So they're, they're really owning this problem. So this from a marketing perspective, what's our product, how are we actually different? So you're talking about a unique, you know, unique selling proposition that that was it for Wendy's and they really wanted to own it. So the formula got to get attention in the first two to five seconds where 80 cents in the dollars spent. Then you've got a promise or a problem and then you've got proof. So they got attention straight off. Where's the beef? You know, that's the idea, but they went through and they had these old ladies. And I think the casting of this was absolutely brilliant. I, I echo that. It was just genius. And especially the lady that says, where's the beef? She is easily the best there mm. on the far right. She was amazing. And they get and hold your attention. And interestingly, yeah, when they she's go- famous. Like, she became famous oh, she, on, that. on the back end of it. So get attention, big bun, big fluffy bun. Then they go through, you know, where's the beef? The promise- they then move into is give you a lot less beef on a lot of bun proof more beef than a whopper or big mac so there's a, a quite a famous insurance company in the u.s that they call it an rtb a reason to believe in all their ads 
they use an RTB. So it's not just a promise without any proof or an RTB. You've got to back it up because everyone's very skeptical on promises because people can promise everything, but few can back it up with evidence or proof or an RTB, which is what they did here. You know, more beef than a Whopper or a Big Mac. Seamless. Where's the beef? She said it three times. It embeds repetition. One ad, three times. Wendy's the brand. They said it four times. Integrated. Four times. Into wow. the script. You wouldn't even know it, but it's this, these subtle differences. This is how... <laughs> like you, that's why this is so good you could watch it time and time again they do not shy away from the brand the brand and the product is the hero they've created a problem they've got a solution and they're embedding their brand and you know i wonder actually believe it or not how much of this was even intentional what you're saying because i think that there's just some people who are so talented that they just instinctively do this i mean you don't if you, if I were to tell a copywriter, you got to mention the brand four times in the ad or whatever, I'd, I'd end up with an ad that, you know, it looks just like, like you're trying to force feed the, the name of the brand or, or the catchphrase, you know, over and over again. I mean, it takes a real skill, like a real director, real talented, creative director, real to, to, to do this eloquently. I mean, you even like now that, now that you just said this, I'm thinking back to, you know, try it, you'll like it. And the waiter said, eat this, you're going to try it, you'll like it. He says it like four or five times. I don't know how many times they say Alka-Seltzer in that ad. I think it's twice or whatever. But also, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. You ate it, Ralph. I can't believe I ate the repetition. Again, it's the, it's sort of the same, same thing. But no, none of it, all of these things became cliches, but they weren't cliches when they started. And I think that's a very important point for people that poo-poo on these sort of things you know, that, that, that you bring up, I'm, I'm just blown away by what you just said, because I might be just too close to the ad having grown up with it. And even, and, and so I'm like, okay, the historical context is interesting, but uh, I, I, I totally missed all that. I mean, I, I like, I just, I'm so, I get so absorbed into watching it that it's every time that uh, I, I, it's, it's amazing what you just said. It's so true though, but I worry about people listening to what you just said and, and then trying to apply it into a formula. So this, uh, is, this is, so this is what we're looking at, especially with super weapons of influence, what we're looking at, like what we've done, we've looked at over two and a half thousand ads and there's formulas that sit behind the best creators of all time. There's a, there's a formula and they correlate, but wow. that's the science. The art is making it feel and look like there is no formula because this is where that's, if yeah. you actually had a formula and people try and follow it very prescriptively, it comes across as forced, clunky, and nearly awkward, or you're trying to sell me something. Whereas this is the art of going, I know there's a formula that sits behind it, but it's executed so elegantly that you'd never know. It's, that's really, really super interesting, actually. And it's given me an idea for something that I'm working on now, uh, where I have something that has a catchphrase on it, but it's, it's, it's like a... Uh, uh, I don't think I mentioned it enough. I think that that's, I think originally we did. And then the client made, and made it like, oh, let's just make it a punchline. But I think it does. I, anyway. <laughs> yes. no, no, it is. But this is, this is the interesting thing about like, if it becomes part of a vernacular, the, like where's the beef? You go into any restaurant and it's got a small bit of, and that's why this has legacy. And I, the reason I also love it you can have an extension of this and you can play it out and you can make different versions of it. It's not just a one ad in solace. It's got, you know, further narrative that can expand from it, but you go into a restaurant and someone's seen this ad and you get a small bit of beef in your burger. Where's the beef? That's the line that comes out. Wendy's is anchored to it. Should have gone yeah. to Wendy's. That's how right. you win. That, that's how you win. Now here's, here is an interesting question for you. That ad played in 1984, when I could count the amount of television networks in the United States on one hand, forget about two. So you only had two places to go with your, with your messaging, you television and print, pretty much, right? Do you think that Wendy's could have pulled this ad off today and, and made Where's the Beef as uh, sailing. I, I'm trying to think in the past five years, has there been any advertiser that's, that's created a, a catchphrase? 
in the last five years? The past 10 years. I mean, can you? No, I'd go, go. It's a very good question. Let's loop back on it because I'm going to create a list and have a look now. Cause okay. Because I'd actually suggest majority of creative agencies now, uh, they do not even look at that. It's it's far more about how do we actually get attention? Like that is a, a big focus of a lot of their work. Yeah, it's, attention. Quite a, it's, a diff, it's a different landscape. And, and this is why I go back to Grilled. Like the subway is really interesting just to loop back on subway. The subway in Australia feels like a lot of the ads we have on air right now. It's kind of the theme, the style. It's kind of a weird guy starting off and they'll do a different shot. It feels nearly like right. a, an alcoholic beverage creative that, that a lot of brands are doing at the moment. But um, let me come back to you because I think it's a great question. Who has actually created, you know, a catchphrase or a saying in the last 10 years, have a look in the US as well. Like I'm actually- No, I will. I, I'm sure there has been, uh, but but the fact that I can't think about it offhand where, you know, and I think it's also a childhood thing a little bit, you know, I think that I can remember, you know, from the carryovers from my parents' childhood. Well, actually, I think they were still playing the Alcazar, so I can't believe I ate the whole thing up until the eighties. I think they ran with that for a while, but- but the you know, 80s like and the, 90s was, was all about this. Like you've got Got Milk and you got all these style yeah. of creatives that, that really looked at how do we own. But within the catchphrase, you look at all of them, the one thing they've got and the overarching principles is it's got to be simple because our, our minds, especially a reptilian mammalian, we're adverse to complexity. Complexity is the death of sales. Complexity is the death of memory. So it's it's a really simple line. So it's interesting. Like I actually love your insight that where's the beef was where's all the beef. Where's and that it was and it was short. The same story with Got Milk was written uh, was written on the whiteboard as like the main idea, like the main positioning statement. And then, you know, uh, the, I think Jeff Gooby was like, I, I like that. I like that. Let's just stick with that. Uh, but um, good call. But but the thing is, is like it's a shame because I think that the internet can drive. Re- talking about repetition, you have a good catchphrase. You could really you could, you could multiply that all day long, right? You could have that, you could have that following people around more than an empty cart notice, you know, (laughs) more than, uh, more than a, Hey, did you forget to to buy this product? I mean, you could really, you know, embed some things into people's head. Now, maybe there's a point in the brain where you go too far with it, but um, you know, a a lot of a, a missed opportunity here, I think is, Taking a lot of these examples that work, that worked in the '80s in print and and, and and television, and finding a way to bring it into into the digital. You know, for some reason, when when we moved it into the digital, it, it just loses its salience, and they think people start thinking, "I I, I got to think more rationally. I got to think more." Uh, something happens. It didn't start out that way, right? You had subservient chicken. You had all these really cool internet when the internet first started. But that's just because it was a new medium. But um, I, I think that what we as an industry need to start doing is really playing around with the internet a little bit more, pushing its boundaries. Believe it or not, it has boundaries. You know, playing around with the Facebook algorithm. If they're going to play with us, let's let's play with them and do some unique things. You know, uh, and 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 just begin to rely a little bit more on the on the humanity of of all of this. Because if you create like a you know a really interesting thing that bends the rules it'll get passed around i mean the only way that facebook could stop it is by stopping it you know (laughs) and which i don't think there'd be they'd have a reason to so it's it'd be interesting because as as we look at historic creative and going back to coca-cola and topo chica like historically it was very overt the brand and the visual identity anchored to the creative Whereas the last decade, we've really moved away from that to be very subtle. Like it's like, we don't want to try and sell anything. We just want an engaging piece of visual content. Mission marketing. Yeah. Like it's, we're really moved away because it's like we, we, we feel guilty or we consumers are too smart and they'll see through our advertising. Whereas, whereas I'm of the opposite view. I'm, I'm like, people actually want great ads. Like that, like that's what they they want. Psychologically. I want to be wooed. I, I, it's about me. It's not about you. It's not about you pretending to be something. I want to be sold. I want your attention. Sell me something. Yeah, 100%. 
Yeah. And we've all got problems that need to be solved. We've all got emotions that we want to feel more of or less of. So how do we, how do we play on that? TV is coming back. You know, I, I know that they don't call streaming. They call it OTT. They don't call them television commercials. And some of them certainly don't look like television commercials, but I've seen some good television commercials snuck into like these, you know, watching the news uh, on, on the CNN app or whatever. And they, they have their commercials. I'm sorry. You can call them whatever you want to call them, but they're more or less commercials. And every once in a while, I see like a nice uh, high budget one that that's uh, one that really grabs your attention, um, you know, in, in, in the old style way. And so as more of the streaming comes in, I think you're going to see a lot more of the television. I think there's going to be a lot more call to action built into it just because it's a they can track it much better than they can with starch ratings and all the stuff that the way you used to do at TV. But I definitely see it coming back. See, I think there's still only four forms of advertising. The mm. internet's just made it far more complex. So you've got, let's call it audio, which was right. radio, but now it's podcast and it's streaming and it's, but it's audio advertising. It's, right. it's, it's using, you know, music and sound to get a message across. You've got video. Video was TV. Now it's BVOD, it's streaming, it's everything else in between, it's catch up, it's video advertising, it's the same. It's just video. There's different video. contexts, but it's video advertising. And then you've got, you know, call it print, but print is just a visual ad. You know, there's no auditory, it's just visual. And then the other one, it's a slight variation of that is banner, you know, which is outdoor. You know, there's yeah. banner ads online. It's kind of like a mini, a mini version of outdoor, although I'd argue far less effective. And yep. then you've got, you know, uh, other forms. It's not necessarily print. It's more long form and it's websites and it's landing page and it's, but it's all. Visual. Well, uh, the billboard one is, is it's as effective as billboards are. I mean, the point of a billboard is to is awareness, right? I mean, so if you spent a lot of money and you didn't care, weren't tracking, people weren't tracking their banner ads. You know, um, you could definitely spend a lot of money and create a lot of brand awareness over the, I've even heard people start referring to them as billboards, which I think is actually digital billboards, which I think they, is actually- they are. The, the challenge I have yeah. with billboards is the way where we're evolving to filter out as we navigate through screens and device to, yeah. to, to actually not visually see them. Whereas, you know, still on roads and billboards and other bits and pieces, they've got more punch. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're actively seeking out where we've kind of evolved from, from not just punch, but shared experience. Correct. And that's also a big problem is the targeting because you could come up with this, where's the beef ad. But the problem is, is that half the population will, will never see it because unless, unless they pay a lot of money to do general targeting on Facebook, which costs a lot of money and is usually advised against, right? So that there is something, right? Well, what is it about where's the beef too? One of the magical formulas about it was that every, you, you didn't have a choice. If you were watching television, you had to see it, you know, unless you change the channel. Like, like whereas a lot of the ads that are advertising that is, when you're only advertised to your target, it, it, you, you lose that. You lose you, that. You do. Experience. And there's a, there's a yeah. lot of studies that reinforce that mass is still the, you need mass and you need segmentation and targeting. You need both. Yeah. You need mass broad reach and appeal, you know, and then you need really hyper targeting and segmentation to, to mm -hmm. give them with really tactical executions of it. You know, if you focus on one over the other, you lose, you got to play both. But um, Justin, I've really enjoyed having you yes. on a special edition. I know it's Friday. I really appreciate time and I no have no problem. doubt the audience will uh, value your feedback. But mate, thank you again. Loved having you on you. the show and yeah. look forward to catching up shortly. Absolutely. You got it. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Justin. Bye.